Now, I don't know what you expect from me on Christmas morning by way of a sermon, by way of a Bible message. I imagine there's probably a few out there hoping that I'm going to be short. You know, the turkey's in the oven, the roast potatoes are on, all of that kind of stuff. We don't want anything to get burnt. We've got things to do and people to see. So that might be some of the expectations. I guess that most of you would like me to preach a lovely, maybe even slightly twee Christmas message that makes you feel all warm inside and go home with Christmas joy in your hearts for a happy and merry Christmas. And certainly I don't want you to have an unhappy Christmas. That's not the message this morning. But over the last few weeks, we have been going through this series of an upside-down Christmas, the fact that Christmas was unexpected for all of the characters in that first story. There was something unexpected, and it changed their lives. It transformed their lives. And however many times we have heard the Christmas story over however many years, the story is still unexpected today. There are still unexpected aspects to the Christmas story, and it can still have a transforming effect on our lives. It can turn our worlds upside down even today. So amid all the good news and peace to all men and all of those kind of messages, there are other Christmas messages too, which at least at first glance don't seem that happy and merry at all. The passage we're looking at this morning comes immediately after Luke's telling of the events of Christmas. Uh, it's an obscure passage, really. It's one that gets lost a bit between, you know, Luke, the beginning of Luke chapter 2 and uh, the birth of Jesus and the shepherds and the angels and then into Matthew, the visit of the Magi, because it comes just after the Christmas Day story. In this passage, Simeon, a righteous and devout man, encounters Joseph and Mary as they present Jesus at the temple for presentation. And he blesses, word, he blesses Joseph and Mary with words which, at least on first reading, must have been tempting to see as something other than a blessing. But these words tell us so much about Christmas that we quite often overlook. They tell us about Jesus, about who he is, and they teach us a valuable lesson about salvation. So let's have a look at these words together from the New Living Translation this morning. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. God had promised Simeon that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah, until he had seen the Saviour. And that promise was fulfilled on this particular day in the temple. So Simeon's initial response was simply to say, I can die a happy man because I have seen the Messiah. That was his message. I can die a happy man because I've seen that this promise has been fulfilled. I have seen the Messiah. Imagine what that must have meant for Joseph and Mary. The word says that they were amazed at his words. But up to this point, they had only had the message of the angel that said that the baby that was to be born to them would be the Messiah, the Son of God, God with us. There must have been times, there must have been moments when they thought, is this all a dream? 
Have we just dreamt it up? Were we hallucinating? And suddenly, for the first time, a few days after Jesus' death, uh, birth, they have the first human to affirm to them the message that they had been told by the angel. This child is the Messiah, says Simeon. Each in their own way had acknowledged Jesus' lordship, but to hear someone else say it must have been a real confirmation for them. But then he goes on in his blessing to say these words in verses 34 to 35. This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He's been sent as a sign of God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your very soul. That's the language of war, isn't it? The language of war. And yet, when you stop to think about it, Christmas is full of the language of war. It's all there. It's in the Bible passages that we read throughout Christmas. It's in many of the carols that we sing. Now, I know you to be a very cultured people, and so most of you will know Handel's Messiah, won't you? Yes. Uh, Some of you are looking a bit perplexed and maybe wondering whether you are cultured or not, but most of us know Handel's Messiah, don't we? So what's the most famous chorus in Handel's Messiah? The Hallelujah Chorus, that's absolutely right. And in that chorus we sing, For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And we proclaim that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. That conjures up for us a particular biblical image. We find these words in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 to 16, where John writes, Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse was standing there. Its rider was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and wages a righteous war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. A name was written on him that no one understood except himself. He wore a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the Word of God. The armies of heaven dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. From his mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. He will release the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, like juice flowing from a winepress. On his robe at his thigh was written this title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And there in those words you have the central claim of Christmas. It's a picture that is as far removed from the baby lying in the manger as you can get, and yet the central claim of Christmas is this. The baby lying in the manger is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's sovereign over all things. And that means that he's sovereign over you and me. Abraham Cooper writes, there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Your relationships, Christ says they're mine. Your possessions, Christ says they're mine. Your money, Christ says it's mine. Your health, Christ says, it's mine. Your thoughts, Christ says, they're mine. Your feelings, Christ says, they're mine. Your words, Christ says, they're mine. Your actions, Christ says, they are mine. The central claim of Christmas is that Jesus Christ wants you to submit to him. He wants to own you. Now, this is divisive, and this is why Simeon's words were so divisive, because it requires each and every one of us to make a decision. It's black and white. There's no grey area here. You either decide to submit to Jesus or you decide to reject him. But the Bible is clear. Romans 14, 11 says, The scriptures say, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance, praise to God. 
We cannot ignore Jesus' claims, even as a baby lying in the manger. Either you'll be repulsed by him or you'll be attracted to him. That's the whole reason that he came as a baby. We're attracted to babies. He wants us to be attracted by him. But that tiny baby lying in the manger demands our allegiance. Jesus himself said later in his ministry, don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. I came not to bring peace, but a sword. Now, those of you who know the uh, Christmas story, and I guess most of you do, to a certain extent or another, may be sitting there thinking, hang on a minute, that message doesn't chime with the message of Christmas. After all, when the, shepherd, when the angels came to see the shepherds, what was the message they were given? That Jesus had come to offer peace and goodwill to all men. So how can he then say, I came not to bring peace to the earth, but a sword? The answer is that that peace only comes after the sword of repentance only after we have submitted ourselves to Jesus Christ, changed our minds and changed our lives, changed our direction. And we all know that repentance isn't easy because it's not just confession, it's not just admitting that we have made mistakes. It's admitting that deep down inside we are flawed, we are rebellious, we're fallen unless the power of God does something to draw us in. No matter how many good intentions we've got, no matter how many New Year's resolutions we might well be contemplating, only the power of God can fight sin in our lives. And that peace that Jesus offers, it only comes after the sword of obedience. There are times in our lives when we are called to make a choice. The choice between comfort and obedience. The problem with choosing obedience is that it will always cost us something. It will always cause conflict in our lives because we live in a fallen world and when we choose to obey Jesus, we experience conflict because we're torn between our will, what we really want to do, and what his will is. But Jesus, the baby lying in the manger, says to us this morning, because I am sovereign over the world, because I am king of kings and lord of lords, in the long run, when you choose to obey me, you will find real peace. R. Kent Hughes says, true peace only comes when, like Simeon, we understand that salvation is Jesus Christ plus nothing and rest our souls in him alone. Every Christian must bow in humility and in poverty of spirit before we can rise to new life in Christ. It's only when we see our own inadequacies that we are ready for God's grace. Jesus Christ came to cause many to fall and to be a joy to many others, and because of that, we can rest in something more than just our best efforts. We can rest in his peace through repentance and obedience. Our walk with God and our faithful service to him are what defines our life. This message of Christmas is to let Jesus turn your world upside down, to let his sword do its damage, to fall before Jesus in humiliation and to receive new grace and new life. Let God heal you of whatever it is that is killing you. At the end of our Christmas Day meeting, find hope again in the message of Christmas. Find the light that will light the whole world for the rest of this season and beyond. Find the glory and peace that Jesus brings for the people of God. And that, my friends, really is good news. Happy Christmas. I'm going to stand to sing our final carol together. Wonderful counsellor, mighty God among us, and we proclaim at the end of our Christmas Day service together that no more we walk in darkness. The light 
has come. Let's stand and sing. And so Christ, who by his incarnation gathered into one things earthly and heavenly, fill us with peace and goodwill and make us partakers of the divine nature. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us this Christmas day and always. Amen. Amen. God bless you.